Number one, Ibble Dibble here. Hello, friends. Welcome back for part two of a variety of red flags, wherein I react and analyze at the granular level, as Megan would say, for a variety interview from October 2022 with Matt Donnelly. This was pre-Spare, it was pre-Netflix series, but she was already revving up her narratives, priming us to believe her stories. One more time for the people in the cheap seats. This is a phrase-by-phrase -phrase analysis. If you are looking for a summary video, this is not it. I'm sure you can find one. Let's get back to it. I've done a lot of internal work. I'm from California, it's in the water. And whether you're exercising or meditating, you're sometimes asked to picture a person that makes you angry. You think about them, you get it all out, and then you're asked to think about them as a six-year-old child. Can you forgive them? That's how I can textually approach that. I find it very telling and disappointing that this is what Megan calls doing the internal work. There's a big difference between effective professional psychotherapy and a yoga teacher. She doesn't plan on doing any internal work, growing or changing in any way. It's about her letting us know that we should hold her to a standard no higher than that we would hold a six-year-old to, instead of unfairly, unkindly, demanding she behave like a rational, moral adult. I've expressed before my serious concerns that H&M not only require professional help and instead are seeking new age alternatives, which there's nothing wrong with, but for their situation, it is not enough. But also my worry that they're trying to sell the rest of us on the idea that all of these things are kind of the same and whatever you can afford to pay them to believe you're now okay is fine. I really hope they don't get any farther into the mental health space. What does Hollywood, as a concept and a business, mean to you? The industry has shifted quite a bit since I was a part of it. How long has it been? I left Suits right after the 100th episode in 2018. I didn't think I'd ever be in the entertainment industry again. But the entire culture has changed. Streamers have changed things. The ability to create zeitgeist moments like we had in the 90s, where everyone would tune in at the same time for a show or gather for one moment. That doesn't happen anymore. She's not wrong. She just seems to be parroting a conversation she had with Bob Iger at a cocktail party. This was the situation in 2018 also. When I was doing Suits, that character, Rachel Zane, was in your living room with you while you were in your pajamas eating Chinese takeout. That's how connected the experience felt then. But to create a cultural moment or conversation requires something different today. Okay, so these two things are unrelated. People have always watched TV at home in their PJs eating takeout. That has nothing to do with cultural zeitgeist moments. And the way she attempts this segue implies that her playing Rachel Zane was a cultural zeitgeist moment. It certainly was not. I had no idea who she was before she started dating Prince Harry. And I believe most people would say the same. Maybe in 50 years, she'll be able to get away with the lie that Rachel Zane was like, like Rachel on Friends <laughs> in the year 2023 too soon. Podcasting has been really interesting in that way. It might be one of the only remaining forums where people are alone to listen. Again, just two unrelated things. Plenty of people watch TV alone and comparing TV and podcasts is like apples and oranges. It's interesting that she's willing to play such verbal and perhaps mental gymnastics to make her work seem more relevant than it is, that at the same time, she's willing to seem less knowledgeable and reasonable than a person in that industry must be. Where else do you have that opportunity? It's almost meditative. It is. This just shows how out of touch she is. 
more people are doing more things alone than ever before. More people of every generation experience feelings of social alienation than ever before. Most people do not struggle with finding a moment alone in a busy day. Most people these days struggle with finding people to connect with in a busy world. Loneliness is a huge issue. It's actually an issue that William and Kate have taken on. What I love, too, is the access to international content that people didn't have before. It's a big departure from what it used to be. Maybe Megan should just admit that she likes creating content, but she doesn't like consuming content unless it's searching for herself online, because obviously piles of international content have been available for years on YouTube, on all the streaming services. And if you get a VPN, I mean, the world opens up. It's been that way since way before 2018. If I were Netflix or (laughs) Spotify or anyone else contractually obligated to work with her, these kind of statements would make me feel really concerned. This is not someone with their finger on the pulse of media. This is an absolutely clueless person. I wonder if she compares herself to an impossible standard TV zeitgeist cultural moments of the 1990s because she's already planning to be lazy and fail. And when she does, she wants people to say, well, it's not the 90s anymore, instead of saying, wow, she sucks at this. Before you left the industry, how palpable was the toxicity that we collectively uncovered in movements like hashtag me too and hashtag Oscars so white? We didn't have a name for it at that time. There were just certain things that were accepted. If there was any discomfort, you just dealt with it. It forced a lot of women to live with this idea of staying silent, not being disruptive, not giving voice to the things that might create concern or discomfort. For me, I had tried for so long to land on a show, filming all these pilots, wondering if they would get picked up. All of season one on Suits, I was convinced I was going to get recast. All the time. It got to a point where the creator was like, why are you so worried about this? Most actors find out they've been recast when they kind of haven't heard from the showrunners when they should have, and they get a call from their agent. It's not something they personally discuss with the show's creators, certainly not multiple times, certainly not something they seek the creator's reassurance on. I wonder if Megan hasn't made a silent confession here. If you go all the way back to my Tom Bauer revenge chapter review on the topic, Megan had an uncomfortably close relationship with the creator slash showrunner of Suits. Maybe they were just friends, but they had lunch together a lot. And there are pictures of them looking very close. (laughs) For two people married at the time, two other people. The fact that Megan even expressed to him multiple times personally, rather than once or twice through her agent, that she was terribly concerned about being recast, maybe indicates that she was willing to be flexible in order to stay on the show. And look, maybe nothing ever happened between them, but she was willing to set up that vibe that if only he wasn't married, She'd totally be on that casting couch. Would you ever consider going back to acting? No. I'm done. I guess never say never, but my intention is to absolutely not. I found it so strange in Harry's interviews for Spare that he was so very insulted by the Queen and King Charles saying that Meghan should continue to act. He tells us in these interviews that they told him they couldn't afford her, they were willing to pay for Kate, but they weren't willing to pay for Meghan. It's so ridiculous. (laughs) Of course they were going to pay for her dresses and makeup artist. Don't be silly. They thought Megan really loved to act because she told you so. She told you, Harry, that she was sacrificing a lot for you. 
She told you this was a big part of her identity. She told them this was her childhood, her education, her career, and her calling. It would be incredibly unfair to tell a painter to stop painting, a poet to stop writing. I don't think Harry is smart enough to imagine all that stuff about racism and anti-Americanism and his status as a spare and put it all on his family. I think Megan twisted his arm and put those sick ideas into his head because she's lazy. She just doesn't want to work. Going through the process you did with the monarchy and then becoming a private citizen again, are those institutions similar? Megan must have written these questions, right? Because absolutely no one the world over would think that marrying into the British monarchy would be anything like getting a job in corporate America. Every business has a model. I worked for NC Universal and the USA Network, and that was all part of a very large organization. Bonnie Hammer was my mentor. Very early on in Suits, she took me under her wing, and that was invaluable to me. Talk about a woman who can balance being a mom, creating so much in the industry, and having a very strong sense of self. I would sit at breakfast with her, studying what she ordered, hanging on her every word. For me, It was always about being able to find your North Star within that model. Find someone who believes in you. Okay, so a North Star is not a person. Um, (laughs) It's a guiding principle. And was Bonnie Hammer really her mentor or somebody she just thought it would be a good idea to suck up to? When Megan was on Suits, Bonnie Hammer was the head of Universal Cable. She was never an actress. She was always a producer and followed the typical track into becoming a programming executive, the president of specific cable networks, and then the head of cable productions under Universal. Today, she's the chairman of NBC Universal. I'd like to give Megan a little credit and say that she realized her days as an actress were numbered and she was cultivating the necessary relationships to get on the other side of the camera. So why does she make it sound so dumb? She ordered what Bonnie ordered for breakfast? Bonnie could balance being a mom with being a working woman? What? Also, given Megan's trajectory, if I were Bonnie, I'd be embarrassed to have Megan say this. She didn't exactly pick a winner. If Megan were smart, she would not be name dropping Bonnie. She would be calling Bonnie, asking to take her out to breakfast for old times' sake, and begging her for some advice as to how to fulfill this Netflix obligation, if not for a job. As complex as any organization might be, There is always something in it that I think is positive. It's important to focus on that. Some industries are very different, and yet, business models for a lot of things, they have a bottom line. That bottom line needs to be held, I suppose. That's just bad advice. Lots of people stick in dead-end shit jobs with abusive bosses, not out of necessity, but because they've convinced themselves that they can't do any better, there's nothing better out there, or it's not really that bad. For someone who in this very moment is supposed to be convincing us of the value of mentorship, Megan is giving very different advice to us readers than she would ever implement. Is she telling us she couldn't find one good thing about being a working royal? Obviously not. She just thinks that she deserves a great life and you deserve a shit life. That upholds somebody else's bottom line, I suppose. Is that all Bonnie said to her? Because it's very clear Megan learned absolutely nothing about producing cable television. Megan achieved her current professional status through her personal, usually intimate relationships with men, not through female mentorship. Let's get real about female mentors. There are very few of them, and they are absolute diamonds in the rough. Most female execs are not walking around handing out careers to eager young women. Speaking of, let's get real about Megan. We've only heard horror stories from her former female employees. Her royal office and Archwell have been revolving doors with female employees in and out, in and out. Has anyone ever called Megan their mentor? Fuck off. 
what is an ideal project for Archul? So much of how my husband and I see things is through our love story. I think that's what people around the world connected to, especially with our wedding. People love love. I'm not excluded in that sentiment. And our definition of love is really expansive. Partner love, self-love, the love of community and family. We use that as the baseline of the kind of shows and documentaries we want out there. That was definitely my takeaway from the Netflix series and Spare. All you need is love. Love is why Harry always listens to William. Ashley was invited to the wedding. They flew down to Mexico to see Thomas in the hospital. Harry was there when both Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth passed away. And the Duke and Duchess of Sussex proudly represent the King and the Crown on Commonwealth business. What? No? No, nut. None of that happened? I, but I I thought all you needed was love. Oh, they don't they don't have any. No extra love to go around. Yeah, that's that's their business's bottom line. The bottom line must be held, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Okay, I understand. For my husband, the Invictus Games have been such a huge piece of his life and his work having been in the army for 10 years and working for the rehabilitation of wounded vets and their families. We talk about emotional injuries that come from those types of experiences. Those are love stories. No, they are not. Why did you have to take credit for the one good thing Harry has ever done and make it weird and about you? For Scripted, we want to think about how we can evolve from that same space and do something fun. It doesn't always have to be so serious. Like a good rom-com. Don't we miss them? I miss them so much. I've probably watched When Harry Met Sally a million times. And all the Julia Roberts rom-coms. We need to see those again. Industry translation? They have absolutely nothing going on, but they would love for you to pitch them. If you're willing to give Megan a co-director credit and cut them in on some residuals. Anything you don't want on your slate? I don't think you'll ever see us doing a horror film. What would you say if one of your kids came to you in 10 or 15 years and said, I want a career in entertainment? I would say, great. When you become a parent, you genuinely want your kids to find the things that bring them complete joy. There are kids, obviously, and they're part of a legacy and a tradition and a family that will have other expectations. They're actually not. You're no longer working royals and you live very, very far away. They'll get invited to weddings and funerals. But I want them to be able to carve out their own path. If it's the entertainment industry, great. And also, good luck. Narcissistic mom translation? I'm not going to help them at all. <laughs> In fact, I'll feel more than a little satisfaction if they are less successful, less rich, less famous, and less popular than me. Oh, did I mention less beautiful? I hope they're less beautiful. There are so many people that will talk about what opened the door for my children. But it still takes talent and a lot of grit. We're creating multidimensional, interesting, kind, creative people. That's who our kids are. Because that's who I'll force them to be. They may only be three and one, but I'm already teaching them mommy is the boss and only the personality traits and behaviors that mommy values count. So if they do achieve any sort of recognition or success despite me, I will certainly take all the credit for that. Is it odd, as an actor, to know that other actors will probably play you in the future? I haven't given that much thought, to be honest. It's all weird. You have to compartmentalize. Anyone talking about me or casting an actor to play me, that will be a caricature of me that has been created for a business that makes people a lot of money. Once you can separate that out, it's much easier to go, okay. That actually has nothing to do with me. It genuinely doesn't. It's a hard lesson to come to grips with. 
Of course, it will have a lot to do with you beyond your depiction. Even if you're dead, it's your estate that is going to be paid for the use of your name, likeness, and story. In other words, your children and grandchildren. You're a narcissist, so you can't see beyond yourself, beyond your death, or why it might be a good idea to not treat your family like garbage, but here's one you might understand. Treat your kids like shit, and the biopic you get will be Mommy Dearest. What's one piece of advice you'd give an actor 100 years from now who is cast as Megan? I hope that in preparing for that role, she finds the softness and the playfulness and the laughter. The silliness. I just hope she finds the dimensions. Definitely the first words I think of when somebody says Meghan Markle. Playful, soft, silly, lightly laughing. Some people would think shameless, gold digging, social climbing, personally and professionally exploitative, an abusive tyrant of a boss, a rewriter of history, a bald-faced liar, a connoisseur of plastic surgery, litigious, self-loathing, the kind of person willing to use dead children for clout, narcissistic, the progenitor of the Markle Claw, such a whiner, Hollywood reject, tasteless, tacky, tone deaf, a fair weather friend, a terrible writer, ruined Givenchy for at least the next decade, humorless, a heartbreaker, tungsten, but not me. I think of the dimensions. Also, she can call me. Is that a playful, soft and silly joke? Or did she already have Diana's psychic on retainer? You mentioned you just went back to your high school, Immaculate Heart. I talked to a few of the girls who had just graduated for Archetypes. They were so incredible. I was so proud of them. And then I surprised some girls at volleyball practice, I saw my picture in the yearbook that a friend sent me the other day. For your senior year portrait, you had to choose a quote to accompany the picture. At 17, I chose Eleanor Roosevelt saying, Women are like tea bags, they don't realize how strong they are until they're in hot water. I don't think I'm a soothsayer, but there is something a little prophetic about that. Yeah, these volleyball girls were amazing because they went to my school and they're kind of like me and they should be really proud of that being kind of like me. So anyway, let's get back to me. I think if I could go back in time, I would just tell myself, don't worry. You are the best and everyone will always want to be just like you, especially you. I promise I'm not a psychic, but I really should have known, right? I mean, I bet all my teachers knew. I mean, (laughs) the way I know now, I am the best. Everyone wants to be me. How important is it to you to be understood by other people? That's a great question. No one has ever asked me that. I can only speak for myself but I think feeling understood and seen are really important. That has been a common denominator that has come up in archetypes and the work I do with communities of women. People just want to be seen. That is also where representation comes into play. Yeah, sure. If the only communities of women you associate with are female celebrities, all that matters is being seen. You'd have to actually talk to real people to recognize the importance of healthcare, education, job security, affordable housing. What is an average workday for you and Harry? We share an office. We work from home, as most people started to do during lockdown. It allows us to have significant time with our kids at this really special moment in their lives. We'll never get this time back. I make breakfast, and we get the kids set for the day. We do a lot of joint calls and Zooms, but also try to divide what we can focus our energies on so we can accomplish even more. My kids have full-time nannies. 
and they also go to daycare. But I do like to make breakfast and that makes me a good mom. Also, we are millionaires. We don't really have to work, but we each have a computer. And if we get a good offer, we will call you back. If you're interested, we had to film around 10 days for Netflix. So that works out to 20 million per day. For Spotify, we gave them a deal. It was actually only $2 million per episode, but I didn't have to have wardrobe and makeup. So we're looking for something around there. My husband is on a 24-hour time zone where half of your life is waking up as the other half is going to sleep. It's kind of the reverse of what I went through living in the UK. He's very good at responding on text. This is a really weird lie, given Harry later admitted that he hasn't heard from his father or brother in forever and no longer has any friends in the UK. Me, I try to be as fast as possible on email. I've always said, if it takes less than five minutes, do it now. Those nasty little palace servants criticizing me for sending emails and expecting responses at all hours of the day and night. I only hold them to the standards I hold myself. Who takes the most snack breaks? It's funny. People sometimes think we live in Los Angeles, but we're a good two hours outside of it. We're commuters. We drove down recently for a day of back-to-back meetings, equipped with chocolate chip cookies the size of my toddler's head. Also, my husband's favorite is in and out There's one at the halfway point between L.A. and our neck of the woods. It's really fun to go through the drive through and surprise them. They know our order. Maybe this is the reason Megan is having more trouble controlling her weight than she did before. And I'm not trying to body shame her here. It seems like she is still pretending to be kind of normal for Harry's sake. Probably she knows somewhere deep down inside that Harry likes a bit of rough and she's it. I'm sure she agrees to do this because it's part of her cosplaying Princess Diana and brings back warm, nostalgic memories for him. I actually find it very funny that she has to pretend she loves the lettuce wrapped in and out burger and a giant chocolate chip cookie, when in reality, she just wants an avocado brie quandini and an oat milk latte. Or even more realistically, she probably wants to have an espresso at home, not have fast food smells in the car, not have to treat their driver to lunch, and go to Craig's or somewhere else she can be photographed when they get to LA. And what a weird thing to say about the in and out workers being members of their adoring public. They don't care about you. She's so narcissistic that even relating an anecdote about something plebeian she does, she still has to be clear that unlike us, she is some kind of VIP. And the interview abruptly ends there. But there is a strange little postscript where the founder of a charity called the Marshall Plan for Moms gives the author a little blurb about how great Meghan Markle is for lending their organization some visibility. Well, you know me. I did a little digging, but that's enough for today. So please join me in my next video on this variety interview where I talk about the visuals, the video, the photo shoot, and um, this charity's tax filings. <laughs> Toodles. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Um.